Donnell Boucher, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Thank you for coming on. And I'm the first, this is the first podcast you've been on since the, a bit of a transition in terms of your career. So I really appreciate you choosing the Pacey Performance Podcast to, as your first podcast post post um, direct coaching, I guess. Thank yeah, you. No, I mean, the pleasure's all mine. And I mean, I, cer- I certainly didn't, you know, write it this way, but uh, you, you know, the timing was right. And I, you know, we're a proud sponsor of yours as well. And um, I've been a big fan of the podcast for a while. You've had a number of my fr- my very good friends. And, and then outside of them, a lot of people that I respect and that I've learned from on the podcast. So very, very happy to be here. It makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I'm happy the timing worked out the way it did. Thank you very much. And I had to wear my play t-shirt, which, as I said to you before, is the three best t-shirts I own. So i uh, got to represent. Yeah, so thank you very that much. Too. You're a good product placement, for sure. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, Donnell, do you want to give us a bit of a background, brief background on, on you? And, and this, I suppose the next hour or so is going to be about this tra- career transition and, and obviously lots of things that come around that. But a bit of background on you, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So for, um, I'm sure a lot of, you know, you being in the UK, there's probably a lot of your listeners that have no idea who I am and uh, and, and equally in the United States. Um, you know, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm from New England, uh, which is the Northeast United States. I grew up in a, in a state called Massachusetts and kind of got into strength and conditioning when uh, I started playing high school football, uh, American football. And, you know, with with that sport over here at that time, this was the late 90s, mid 90s, uh, strength conditioning was just, at least in our part of the country, it was starting to take hold as if you were going to play football, you really got to be lifting weights. And long story short with football, I was a very average, even throughout college, I was a very average football player. And I always had more of an affinity towards the training and the preparation of football um, than sometimes, you know, practicing. And, and I mean, I wouldn't say I, I like training more than the games, but the, the off season and the prep, the tactical preparation, the physical preparation, those are the things that really wrote me in. And it was one of those deals where it was, it was, a it, I was good at it. You know, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I've got a little bit of uh, winter weight on them in my, I'm, I'm pushing 40 right now. So I'm like, I'm as heavy as I've been since college. But uh, back in when I was 14, I was 180 pounds. So I was a big kid uh, starting high school, playing football. And then when I got in the weight room, I can remember the first time we were, I was lifting with the uh, seniors in, in, at, at my high school, Chicopee Comprehensive. And I was like, we were trying to bench press 200 pounds. And there was a, a good number of older kids that couldn't bench press 200 pounds. And I get up there and at, I think I was 14 or 15. I mean, I was able to get it. So that was that moment where everybody was like, whoa, you can do that. You know, I wasn't great in math. I didn't have, like, I couldn't like freestyle rap or, or I didn't have many talents. But like, <laughs> that was the thing that people were like, whoa, you, you're, you're good at that. And that moment was the moment that sparked me into like being really into it. And like, I get to the end of high school. I was the kid that had the 25 pound weight in the back of my trunk with a, with a, with a speed ladder and, you know, a medicine ball. And I would have five or six of my teammates and we'd be going to high school at 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. And, and just doing the most random training that you would have ever thought of. And I was like the leader of that group. College was almost the same thing, except that I had this lucky, lucky timeline where when I got to Worcester State, which is a division three college, um, there were three people on that team who were seniors that were going to be strength coaches. And at this, this time, this was 2001, I didn't even know you could be a strength coach as a career. It was just a, it was a hobby. It was a way to get ready for football. And when I got to college, there were these three guys. Teddy Perlack was a longtime strength coach in college over here. Jeremy Frisch uh, owns his own uh, facility yes. in Clinton, Mass. Be on the podcast. You, yeah. yeah you, so you know Jeremy Frisch, just a tremendous mind and a tremendous person. And, and then Frank Nash, who is, uh, he's, he's got a, a couple of like boutique gyms up in Massachusetts now, Frank Nash Training Systems. And like, he's really successful in the private sector. Like I, I, I saw him a couple years back, he was speaking in China at a, at a fitness biz conference. So at 18 years old, I got these three guys on my team. They took me under their wing and that was it, man. I was hooked. I changed majors. I was an, I was a, um, I was a accounting major. I switched out of that within like three or four months. And I went to, uh, I think it was health education at the time. And, uh, really those, those three guys were responsible for getting me, me going, um, around, around performance training. And then, uh, ended up at the Citadel in 2007, 
to the uh, to to you know I'm very grateful to my good buddy Adam Fight, who is now a professor at uh, Springfield College. He was also a high school teammate of mine, two years behind me, and um, he helped me get my foot in the door at the Citadel. They were looking to hire a second GA at the time that he got his GA, and came down in 2007. And within one year, so less than a calendar year, I think it was 10 months after being hired as a GA, uh, I got to interview for and got the head job. So at 25 years old, I was hired as the director of strength conditioning at the Citadel, which was an amazing place. And um, I, you know, I was familiar with it because I've got military in my family, but I didn't really understand the tr- like the, the history of it. I didn't understand the the location. I didn't know anything about Charleston at the time, and um, wasn't aware of the Southern Conference, and and had no idea about the passion and the just the love that our alumni have. Uh, for our program. And so through, through like the next 14 years is what got us to this point. I, I was promoted, I think three or four times, had a number of, of, of contract restructures, title changes. And I, and I know that that's going to be a, a key piece of this. We're going to talk through, I hope we talk through some of that in good detail. That's something I'm, I'm happy to share about the process there. Um, but then I reached a point at, at 14 years in where stars kind of aligned, uh, you know, something that would have been brewing for a number of years with some people that I really trust and really respect. Uh, an opportunity came to fruition and it was put on the table. And I did like I did three, four times before, actually probably f- it was more than four times, um, uh, look, looking at an outside job offer. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't hundred percent with those outside job offers though. I, 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 you know, earned a couple of them where I had a concrete offer and I, uh, I didn't win the interview on some of those, but I had been in uh, interview discussions and interviews before uh, this one. And this one came up and a very different, it was a certain change of lanes and a different industry, but was the right fit at the right time. And it ended up working out. So now I'm, I'm just about two months in uh, with play and it's been an awesome, it's been an awesome transition in and I, I, I couldn't be more happy or ecstatic and uh, really excited to talk about the things that led up to this point and how I believe they really prepared me uh, for a move like this. The next point that we that I'd love to chat about is the networking side, but how much, how much did your network and your depth and breadth of network help in this, with this transition? Well, what I'll tell you is I think, first of all, like I'm, I'm not like, you're not talking to the, the greatest networker expert guru that exists, right? I'm far from that, but I will tell you that networking has always been like, one of the North stars, if not the North star in my professional, uh, in my professional experience. And this is something you hear even in undergrad, you, everybody's heard that your networking is, is important in strength conditioning. And, um, you know, I took that to heart, but one thing about me is I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a face value guy. I'm a, I'm a born skeptic. So I'm the guy that hears that, but then I say, all right, but what does that actually mean? And, and, and unpack that for, if you're the, if Rob, if Rob was just going to tell me, Hey, Donnell, it's really important. You got to get a network. Well, Rob, can you unpack that for me? What exactly do you mean? And I would, I would get responses that just weren't, I, I, they never really connected the dots and I didn't feel they were satisfactory. So I started doing like I do with every puzzle that I come across that, that, that interests me or that somebody tells me, Hey, this is worth, this is worth uh, your effort. Um, I dig into it. And I researched it and I started to figure out like reverse engineer. Okay. What does this actually mean? Is it just passing out a business card at the, at the conferences? Cause I see that happen a lot. Yeah. Um, still. That, yeah. Still to this day. Like it's just, so is that what networking means? Um, is networking, you know, now in the age of social media, is it posting your athletes working out? I think that's a part of it, but I don't think that's, that's just a piece of it. You know, I think that's a, a serious piece of it and something that, I think we've changed our perspective on over the, over the course of like, like my career at the Citadel back in 2007. And I'll tell you that even before that social, I was in college when Facebook was created. So I remember what it was like before social media, where, you know, you had to wait for your mom to get off the phone at home and then you could get on AOL. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, you had to wait for it. So I remember in 2001 when social media didn't exist, if you wanted to network or go learn, you had to drive, you know, you could get on the phone, but if you wanted to see some things, you had to get on, a, you had to drive or go to a conference, which nobody had, mo- I didn't have money for a conference until three years in to being a head strength coach. 
we had some good people around me in Massachusetts, but it wasn't easy to, to at, at 19, 20, 21, pick the phone up. Well, like I, I called Mike Boyle and say, Hey, I want to come be a fly on your wall. I mean, that he's busy. I, I'm nobody. I'm getting started. Now come to find out Mike Boyle being up there, he is an open book. And if you yes. do contact him, he yep. will gladly let you in. He's always been a guy. And that's, I was really lucky coming up in New England when I did, because there were some key names that are just, even to this day, are some of the, just the giants in our field that I was influenced by at a really young age. And Mike Boyle is certainly one of them. But, uh, you know, network is so unpacking networking. What does it mean? And, and what I would tell you now is that like networking to me now, if you ask me to define it and what, what might I give like a younger strength coach uh, today, what might I tell them that they need to be thinking about? in terms of networking, networking to me in one sentence is about helping people. That's, and I, and I, will, I will delve into that, but it's about helping people. So it's not just about shaking someone's hand. It's not just about um, passing out your business card. It's not just about having an online presence. All those things are parts of it. But I think where networking really happens and in my experience, this is what happens. So I'm not trying to say this is gospel, but in my experience, how do, how, what would I say networking was the, where was the real value in networking for me? It's when I could help somebody else in some way, shape or form. So what do I mean by that? How, how do I, like, Joe Ken is the, he's what I would call my, my mentor. He was the most influential person in my career, um, professionally, even elements of personally, socially, all that stuff. He would be the guy that I, who's your main influence? Joe Ken. Never worked for him, but for some reason, he's been tight with me and, and you know, he had a good bit, of, bit to do with getting me to where I'm at now uh, because of his relationship with Rich Gray and, and you know, the whole leadership of play. So, um, but how am I helping Joe Ken? So I met Joe Ken in 2008, I think. Um, you might say, well, how, did, how are you as a first year strength coach helping out one of the goats. I'm not helping him with his programming. I'm not helping him with, you know, anything with his job, but I can tell you one thing, one thing I helped him with was he happened to be in Charleston. He, he vacations here with his family and uh, he needed a place to train. And so I, I got him like, this was before Uber. Uh, Uber wasn't down here and all that. So I got, I was like, man, I can meet Joe Ken and have him come lift at my, my weight room. I jumped in the car. I drove 25 minutes over to uh, Isle of Palms or Sullivan's Island, wherever he was staying, picked him up, had him come over, spent all the time. In the and you know what he did when he was there? He lifted, you know, for whatever, an hour. But then he sat in my office and was a complete open book. And so, you know, that was an opportunity to, to help somebody. Um, and, and that's the way he responded. And he, he sat in my office longer than he trained that day. And he answered my questions and looked over my stuff, gave me feedback on my, uh, on my templates and everything. So that's one example of helping somebody. You might help somebody by, by connecting. Like maybe you want to know who's, uh, who's somebody else that is in a similar role as me and you want to talk to somebody else, you know, six months from now uh, on, a, on a career advancement-based conversation. Well, you ask me to help you with that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you a name. I'm going to give you a yeah. list. You've done that already, Donnell. You've way. done that already. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot you. I forgot, I'm doing already. I forgot you. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a yeah. list because because I just want to help yeah. you, man. Uh, out of the out of this respect for a colleague and um and and I can't help you. I can't tell you how to run your mm -hmm. podcast, but I mean, we spent ten minutes trying to figure out how to work this <laughs> microphone. Um, I can't tell you how to run your podcast, right? But I can if I can connect you with people, I'm happy to do that. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it's, um, you, you want a perspective that's an outsider's perspective and, and you, you're getting your first job at a military school and you've never worked at a military school. I don't care who you are, where you're from. You, if you want my help on that, I'll give you my help on that. Um, and maybe it's something else. I mean, help is not, is not going to pick somebody up in a car. That wasn't, the point of that wasn't like, that's the way you help somebody. Help is a thousand things today and with social media since we did talk about that this is the first time in history where we've got the ability to help people in public that never existed prior prior to now so like a discussion for me on twitter is really valuable about 
whatever. I, mean, I just made a post about APRE. I, share, I shared a document that I had used at the Citadel for a number of years. And there's, there's incredible conversations going on in DMs, going on in the comments section. People are sharing stuff. People are, you know, there's a little bit of infighting talking about who was the, who, who gave birth to APR. And, and those type of conversations to me, I think they're helping people because we're helping them connect with other colleagues. And I think that's networking. So, yeah. So to me, networking is, can be boiled down uh, to how are, how are we helping one another out or how are we helping somebody else that, that can't even return the favor right now, but maybe they'll think about it three years from now or 10 months from now. It's, it's not about like a transactional thing. It's just about helping people, man. And I think that we've got an opportunity to do that at a greater scale than ever before in human history. And that's what I've done. So that's, that was networking for me. And I, I've been doing that since they told me to run away from it. I can remember the first conversation I had, um, you know, in college, my first job, my first uh, at the Citadel, compliance officer said, this is going to be a problem. You better stay away from it. And I'm the ultimate contrarian, right? Like if, if, uh, if you tell me that, you're going to make me do the opposite. I'm going to almost like, there's a reason that you're scared of it. And I want to know why you're scared of it. It's probably because you don't understand it. And there might be some value there that if you're scared of it, maybe everybody else is scared of it. Maybe I have an opportunity. So I dove into that. And that's what I've been doing since the very beginning. I've just been trying to provide value. I've been trying to show people what we do. Uh, I've been trying to engage with, with colleagues. Uh, education is a piece of it. And then there's an element of entertainment. Like, I, I'll be totally honest with you. There's, if you go to my like Instagram or whatnot, you're going to see a good dose of my personality, my, my, my interests. Um, I, Cause I don't want to be a tight wad strength coach. I want to, I, I want to be, I want to show that strength coaches are, are, that we can be fun, exciting, well-rounded, versatile people. And now we have the ability to do that. So that was always been the mission when you talk about uh, social media, but to, you know, to close up the networking conversation, I, I, I've always thought about strength and conditioning, the performance industry as a people business first that happens to deliver performance enhancement. So think about that dynamic, right? What if you flip that? Most people, I think when we come out of uh, school, like undergrad, we come in thinking that we're going into the performance enhancement business delivering to the people. I don't think that's the case. And I'm not, I reserve the right to be wrong. I'm the opposite. I, we are in the people business delivering strength and conditioning, performance enhancement. And I've always kept that mindset. And that has kept me on a, on a, uh, on a healthy path, a healthy path, which, which, which I, if you ask anybody that's worked for me or the kids that I coached, um, I'm definitely a chameleon. And I, and I want to be that because you've got to be that as a strength coach. If I'm bound to one system, if I'm bound to one discipline or one mentality philosophy, I'm, I'm, I'm underserving my people. I need to be well-rounded and, and as, a, as, a, as a practitioner. So I just, I think if I'm well-rounded as a person um, at, at, the, at the place that I just came from, at my level, I think that's the way that I best serve, I best serve that population. Would you agree? And this is, this is, when I say, would you agree? This is my opinion coming on to you to get your opinion. That when it comes to networking, people, and this is probably quite hard not to do, especially when you're younger, because you do want something. Like, it is genuinely, I, I would like something from this person. And it is quite hard to remove yourself from that and go, how can I just be a good person? How can I just be a good guy and offer my help, offer my facility, offer my time, which is a big thing that people can do that everyone wants more time. So to be able to offer your time is obviously a good thing. But it's so hard to, to not go down the, I'm expecting something back. And I think once that flip is made, when it's just about being a good person, it's not about networking. It's not about the word. Just be a good person. Be open but and be openly open. It's all right saying, oh, I'm open. Anyone can come to, to, to see my facility, to see my program. But if no one actually knows that, it doesn't make a difference because no one's going to reach out and, and, and do that. So it's been openly open. And I think another thing that came to mind when you mentioned about your social media I think a big thing is to show that personality and to be not only be interested in other people, but be interesting so people are interested in you. So do like show your personality. What else do you do? What 
Like, what's your family life? What, where do you go on holiday? Like, what do you do? Like, are you a rounded person or are you just talking strength and conditioning 24-7? Because once that, that barrier is broken down to become a person, that's when like-minded people come to you. And that's when conversations start. That's when network, the true networking actually happens. But back to my first point, which is two weeks ago, do you think it's quite hard for people to remove themselves from that need of some of that request, that needing something, especially younger coaches when they genuinely probably do want something? It's quite hard for that removal for me. What's your thoughts on that? Sure. Sure. So are you speaking to, if I'm a younger coach, that, that, that I am going to let my need for, for a transactional response, that that's going to deter me from putting stuff Yeah, I'm there? just, I'm just thinking that... like, I'm a young coach and I would love to work with Donnell. Like I would love it, but I need to refrain from saying, Donnell, can I have a job and go, Donnell, have you read this research paper? I think you'd, I think you'd love it. Or Donnell, once you're in town, give me a shout. I'd love to buy you a coffee. It's hard to play the long game versus go, Donnell, have you got any internships? Have you got any, have you got a job going? Like it's, it's so hard because you do want that. It, the, the younger coach does want that job. I gotcha. But it's that difficulty in playing the long game versus playing the playing the short game. Yeah. So now I understand the, the, the frame there that you're trying to present. And I, and I do, uh, I can appreciate that and respect it fully. And here's what I would say. I, I think it's like, it's like, it's like any relationship. Imagine, you know, my wife's name is Vicky, right? And imagine if you were entering into the, the first transaction with your future wife and that's how you started. You started with, Hey man, I, can I be your boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> Are you available for a boyfriend? <laughs> you know, there, there's a uh, there's a courting process involved and yeah. and i would say that uh so there let me package this into two two pieces here there is a line there's a line of demarcation right where where you you gotta you gotta focus on the needs and the responsibilities of the job that you are in first so in other words if i'm if i'm down here as a ga at the citadel and I am prioritizing my Instagram over the reports that I got to get to the head strength coach, the trust that I have to build in the eyes of the sport coaches, the trust that I got to build in the eyes of the athletes, then I'm putting the cart before the horse because at that point in time, that's not the priority. So each stage of a career is going to have different ratios of I need to focus on my social media online presence, but I need to, I need to really, before I get to that, I got to take care of the big rocks first. And the big rocks right now are, for me, it was always, it was competency or effectiveness. That's what, when I hired a staff member, it was all about effectiveness first. How effective are you at the job description? So if the job description was to work with soccer, uh, tennis, assist with football, data management, and internship program, how effective are you executing those five things? Before you start talking to me about your social media presence, these five things better be aces. And it's my responsibility as the leader to keep you on that path, to inform you about why it's important, and also to evaluate you and provide feedback on route. Now, when you've got these five things down, now we can start shifting over to what my next thing was, now that I got a staff member in, efficiency. Let's do these five things in 80% of the time. Okay, so instead of it taking you 100% of the time to do these five things, we got you so good at being effective with it, your efficiency just opened up more time. So now you've got better efficiency. Now we could talk about your online presence. We could talk about um, what's the next thing you want to learn about. Do you want to learn about uh, velocity-based training? Do you want to learn about um, you, you know the sports science realm? Because now that you're past those first five things and you're effective there, we can, we can improve efficiency and we can expand your scope. That was the last E that I, as a, as a, as a leader, effectiveness, efficiency, and expand. And then if you did those three things, guess what happened? You became a more attractive job candidate. And I think right with that conversation, so once you've determined where you're at and what needs to be the, you know, the, your, your big rocks, 
Um, now you start just in the in whatever way that you can, you present your body of work. And whatever that is for you that you're comfortable with doing, then that's what you do. If you're big on TikTok and you want to go on there and, and, and talk people through a, a, like the only post I ever made on TikTok, my TikTok career was short-lived. It's the only one. Only one. There's only one <laughs> post. It's our volleyball team. And what I did was I did a TikTok video of them training and I talked through the session. So I explained everything that we did in like a, whatever it is, a minute or minute and a half. That to me was where I was going to bring value to TikTok. Now, at that point in my career, that was like a year ago, I had a lot of things going on. I, I had to determine that well, here's my line. Like, I, I, I don't have time for this right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay working with what I know and what, I've, what, I'm, what I'm good with because I've got to focus on these other areas. Um, so I think that's important for any young person to learn. But then the second piece of this, the, the cold, harsh reality of it is, Rob, is that unfortunately in this world, this thing of ours, the amount of competition that you're going to face as a candidate is probably up there with the top, I mean, it's up there, right? It's in the top third of most competitive careers because the jobs are not abundant. I mean, we're getting more jobs now because of the military and high schools and things like that, but it's, they're not abundant and there's an overabundance, oversaturation with, with people looking for work. So you have got to balance that and you have got to take networking and, and reaching out that helping hand and making those connections. You've, you, you cannot neglect that. If you think you're going to enter into this field and just be a good strength coach, like you were talking about being well-rounded, guess what? The kids that you're working with are all, that, that is what they are right now. They are a, they're a cornucopia of experience. They don't, they don't have the life experience to be specialized yet. So that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with these, these just spectrums. Like every kid is a spectrum. Every athlete is a spectrum. And if you've only got one piece of that spectrum, that's, that's not a winning recipe. Uh, at least not at my level. Now, if you want to talk about getting into like the highest level of sport and you're a genius with data visualization or, or GPS and analytics and that type of stuff, okay, you, you might have a chance there. If, if you're the, if you're going into the Olympics and you're the Gale Hatch of 2022, okay, you, you, but that, how many people of those exist and how many people are at this level or below or assistance? So I'm playing percentages here. Um, so I think that you got to balance all that. And, and I love your description. You framed it as, do I start an email and say, hey, do you have any jobs available? Like, I don't have a problem with that as long as you frame that professionally and respectfully. Because we're all trying to eat. Like, I'm never going to knock somebody for looking to us for an opportunity. But if you come at it with a one-liner, hey, I just graduated. I think I'd be great for your program. Here's my resume. I, I, I didn't even... I just spoke more words of that fictional email than I would have read. Yeah. I would have hit delete before <laughs> I even got through that sentence. Um, now there are examples of people that did it the other way and they respectfully had it, you know, they put in there a connection and Hey, here's how I got turned on to you. Here's what I like about your program. Because in, in my situation, our program's out there. If, if you're really committed to being a strength coach, then you're committed to networking. And at this point, when you're trying to get a job, you should have been able to click on my Instagram and go there and, and just, and, or YouTube and found something out about the Citadel. So I always like that. I always like to demonstrate that I did homework prior to this email. I know who Rob Pacey is because I've listened to your show. I saw, I heard Brian Mann on it. I heard, uh, I think it's Jeremy Shepard, the, yeah, the yeah. Uh, boring guy. I saw him. Present. You know, I, I, I'm not, trying to sell you some snake oil right now. I, like I'm being real with you because you, you have, you have inspired me and I'm aware of what you do. That's why I'm interested in contacting you. I, I never liked the, the, the one, like, this is why I think I'd be a great part of your staff. You don't know. Do you know what I value as I, I had one person reach out and say, and say, yeah, because of you know this education and this and that I'm going to be, it make me be the ideal fit for the Citadel strength conditioning. So I responded back and said, Hey, thanks for the contact. Can you tell me what we value as a staff? And, you know, uh, Did you get a response? Coach, it, yeah, because, you, you know, because because that's I, I never would say like, yeah, I, I would I would ask questions. like, What are you looking for? I, I'm out here trying to find a job. I'm ready to come and learn. I've seen what you do. I would love to be a part of that staff and learn your system and learn your philosophy and, and be a team member. Um, 
So those are some ideas that I have. And I think that if you balance it that way, where, where, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you now, like you, you, with the examples you used, those are the connections that I got. The people that said, hey, welcome to the Southern Conference. You know, Tommy Rowling is at Samford. He's been at Samford for a long time. He's uh, base. I, I don't know exactly what he's handling now. He was the baseball strength coach for a long time. When I got to the Southern Conference, two names that stand out to me, Tommy Rowling at Samford and Jeff Dillman, who was at App State at the time. Now, Jeff Dillman was coming off of national championships at Appalachian State, right? And they were the big dogs in the conference at that time, 2007, 2008. Tommy Rowling sends, gets, I don't even know how he got my email, but he got it. And he sends over an email and says, hey, coach, welcome to the Southern Conference. I'm happy to hear you. I'm happy to have you in. Welcome aboard. It must be exciting. Charleston's a beautiful place. Let me know if I could ever help you. Oh, that, that email was filed in, this, in my head and my heart for eternity. And then Jeff Dillman, we go up to play them. And I'll be honest with you. They were heavily favored because <laughs> they're like, you know, we're, we're, I mean, at that point we were, we were figuring things out and App State was App State. Jeff Dillman makes it a point before the game. He probably don't remember this. He, he, he comes over and seeks me out before the game. You know, he got done with the warmups and, and uh, somebody grabs me and goes, hey, D, the, the, uh, the, the, it's a big guy from App State looking for you. And I look over and it's Jeff Dillman on our side of the field. You know, hey, hey, coach, what's up? And he, you know, big bear hug and shakes my hand. And in a five minute conversation, he proceeds to tell me that chocolate milk was 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 helping them out with some weight gain. Because I had said, you know, my biggest thing is like, how do we get weight gain on these people? He tells me this whole chocolate milk. Here's how we got it. Go through your dining services. And that that chocolate milk, like it has, it has evolved over the years and it turned into an actual proper sports nutrition uh, thing now. But that right there was a game changer for me. He don't even remember that, I bet. And that was a five-minute conversation because he was willing to just come over and say hello. And that right there is networking. That, that's, that's networking, man. It's not like, hey, man, you want to be my assistant someday? Or, or it was just helping, helping somebody out. And that, that's what I would advise people to do. If you can say that, like, you know, share that you read something, you read a publication, a study, you listened to a podcast, you saw them present, here's what I liked. And, man, I would love to stay in touch with you and maybe bounce some questions off you if you ever have yep. time. I, I get a, not loads of messages, but a couple, like say if someone comes on to discuss, I don't know, hip and groin injuries, I'll get maybe a message or two after that. Hey, this, this person has a little bit of a different opinion on this. This is the name. This is the Twitter account. They do some really good stuff. Maybe here's a few papers that they've, that they've um, contributed. So maybe good to get a different opinion. How good is that? Like that's that's someone who's listened to the, the episode, been critical, thought, yeah, this could this could could offer a different perspective. I I reach out to them people and like you say, you log it and you think, what a good person. I don't know that I don't know them, don't know where they're from, like no contact them before. But how good is that? Just being a good person, being interested and giving up their time to to send some resources over and, and be and be a good person. So yeah, all for that. Massive, yeah. So I'll, if, if, we, if we can stay yeah. on this just for a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. pivot this because I recently was in a conversation. This was probably a month ago. I was in a conversation and I'm going to tie it into what you just finished with being a good person, right? And, and, I, and we had gotten to a point in the conversation where we, we were talking about um, – you know, presenting value within your institution or your organization and all that. And I, and I had made the comment like, okay, helping people. Uh, and, and I do want to, I do want to put a little bit of a, a flag in the ground here. And I do want to say that that has to be considered and it has to be, you have to weigh. <clears throat> in other words, if, if I want to be a really good person, I can go spend 50 hours a week at the soup kitchen. Okay, so my, my, my point is, is you've got to be careful with, with where you're extending yourself. Now, the things that we're talking about here are, are simple. Let me just, but I don't want a listener to hear you and I be a good person. And now you run with that. And what you're doing now on, on Monday morning is you're taking out the trash good at point, your college. Good point. Yeah. Or, or, or you're doing you're doing a staff member's work that they have pawned off on you because they took advantage of you. 
So I do want to put a flag in the ground and just say, 100%, being a good person is the route to, to good networking. It's not having some like sadistic end goal or manipulative like timeline where you're trying to push an agenda. However, if you take being a good person and you run rampant with that at work, you will be taken advantage of at some point. And this is where um, one of the things I said in, in a conversation before was, you, you know, and I had, to, I had to tell a coach this at one point was, coach, I'm here to serve your program. I'm here to serve your kids. I'm here to serve your mission and help you get to where you need to go. But I'm not here to be your servant. And I mean, I literally, I verbalized that in a conversation. I mean, I've, I've shared that point with some people. But today's favors are tomorrow's expect. I have this conversation once a month with a staff member, once a week with a staff member at my, at my previous job. Today's favors are tomorrow's expectations. And you have got to make sure. So how do, you, how do you go about knowing what's the right thing to do, right? I think the first thing is, is like, does this, does this task fit my level of expertise in education? So if, if, if look, if you're, if you're a, if you're a, a, a hundred pound man who is in, in his 65th year of life and he's doing a retirement job and he needs help taking the trash out and I'm walking by him, I'm taking the, I'm picking the bag up and I'm taking the trash out. Right. But if someone comes to me and says, you know, Hey D uh, you know, facilities is kind of strapped right now. Can you guys take over the trash uh, disposal week to week? Um, if I do that, I just became the highest paid trash disposal person uh, in the world. That's not a good use of my organization's compensation or, or what my role is in that within that within that company. Um, so you've got to does it fit my level of expertise, education? You've got to be honest about that. And then can I, can I, can we frame this up in a way where it doesn't turn into a never ending expectation? Sure. I'd be happy to help you with the trash. How long do you foresee you guys are going to be understaffed? Six months? Well, I'll help you this week, but you're going to have to figure out something else after that. I'm happy to do that. Uh, the next month, that's it. Sure. I'll assign an intern every week. We'll rotate it through a schedule. No problem. We're happy to help you out. There's a way you could put a framework on that and set a timeline. Um, and then I think, you know, does this fit in the grand schemes of like collaborative and moving us towards the institutional goal? So again, if I'm helping you take out the trash for that one instance of time, I'm helping you tend to your responsibilities and getting you over a potential speed bump. That's helping us move towards the institutional goals. Um, here, here's one that happened in real time. Okay. Um, this happens five times a year at a, at a college. Administration needs help with things, okay? We had a gender equity review coming up from the NCAA. And if you're not familiar with what that is, any college strength coach that is familiar with it, that's, that's not the highlight of their, of anybody that's done it, you know, that's a, it's a tedious, like it's a, I mean, you, you've got weeks and weeks meetings and like there's binders and like you're doing research, like, I knew we needed it. I knew our administration needed a hand. I knew that I was at a point in my career where I could step away for three hours a week and, and attend to that, that, that task. Um, so I volunteered to do the gender equity review. I volunteered to be um, uh, on the RFP request for a proposal for our new dining contract. I, I was thrilled at that. We were getting a new dining contract and who else in the athletic department has a better understanding and knowledge of nutrition or, or food and, and, and like athletic needs than me? If it wasn't me, it was going to be uh, an administrator who, who was probably uh, deals in finance. And what do finance people do when it comes to food? They buy cheaper stuff. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I'm thrilled at that. And that process was a massive undertaking. Now that started with me be, being a good person, but it also had a, a, we were moving the ball forward on that one. And I was using my skill set, using my education and expertise and efficiency that I worked for up to that point to move the ball forward. So um, those are things that, uh, oh, and then can I be passionate about it, right? So like, like, <laughs> I, I, like if the finance guy, and like this, this is always interesting, I know finance is important, right? Obviously it's arguably one of the most important things. Well, if the finance guy came to me and said, hey, Donnell, I want you to help me with, uh, 
I don't know, like the, <laughs> some fight. I don't even know terminology. In let's, say, let's say there's some like really hard thing to do in finance. Like I don't have the, I don't have that ability. I could, I wouldn't, I couldn't be passionate about it to break through and do the homework on what I needed to do. I, and I, and I would end up falling short with, with that, with that request. You ask me to help you with nutrition. Okay. I got a background in nutrition. I know where to look when I need to look at like institutional and survey. I got, I got people I can call at uh, Clemson. How do you guys feed your team? You know, I can call my network and I can do that. To, and I can be really passionate about that because I know the, uh, the stop gaps that we face as an athletic department at the Citadel. So I think those things are like, if you look at, you know, does it fit my expertise education? Is it, uh, is it something that moves the ball forward? And then is it, uh, is it something I can be passionate about? That's how, you know, if me being a good person in yeah. this case is the right move. Great examples. Not. Great examples. Just you've, you've mentioned a couple of, um, I think there was a three E's that you, you mentioned moving into the kind of staff development side of things. I'd love to get, cause I'd love to get your opinion and your thoughts and your experience on, on younger coaches coming through. Cause there'll be younger coaches out there who are listening to this, who followed your stuff. Like you mentioned on YouTube, social media programs, whatever. What are the gaps that you see in young coaches coming through now? And have them gaps changed over time as degrees have got more specific, less specific, more focused on one area, less focused on one area. But is there a commonality among young coaches in 2022 that can, that you can identify here that they can take on board and plug? I don't... So, I love the younger generation. I, I love where the industry is going. I love the younger people that I've worked with. Um, I love the interns that have come through. I loved our student managers. I love my staff members that have come through. I, I have been repeatedly, and I know I may be in a minority here, but I have been repeatedly impressed and excited about where our profession's going. Now, I, I would be I wouldn't be neglecting a major piece that I think is worth talking about is part of that reason that I've been so impressed is we put a lot of time and effort into a screening our applicants and B or interviewing our applicants. And then B, this is the big one because everybody in everybody interviews out there, right? Here's something that I think about that. I don't know that everybody else thinks about. And I would say that if I could advise a leader, or a person that's in a leadership position in any sector, private, military, college, pro, whatever, is for the time that you're spending on writing a great program, you need to look at the amount of time that you're spending creating a great place to work that people want to come and work. And we did that for over 10 years. I've always done that. I did that. When I was bartending, I wanted to have the bar that the, I wanted to have the, I wanted to have the night. So if it was your college night, I wanted your college night to be the best night of the week for your college night. And that's, um, that's something I, you know, I got my start in strength conditioning, um, in the private sector with a company called cats. And I knew really quickly that I didn't want to be in that. I mean, because we were working for every, with everybody from like little kids. I mean, I think the youngest kids we had in there were like nine and 10 years old. And then we were all the way up to adults. And it was every program you did was athletic based in nature. So it was an awesome first job, but I knew that my direction was college. So I knew that I didn't want to be there. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't take a lot of freaking lessons away from that year that I spent with cats. And one of the, ex one of the um, lessons that I took away was the customer experience because they're not, see, here's the difference between private sector and public sector, college coaching, private sector, all your clients are going away in December and January, and you've got to re-recruit them back. You have got to market them back. You've got to love them up. You've got to follow up. You've got to sell. And you got to find cost saving opportunities and you got to manage your budget. We don't have to do that in college. Our customers and clients are they're there. Back. <laughs> <laughs> they're there. <laughs> and I think honestly, Rob, that is a massive. So I was so, okay. To back to the original question, gaps in younger generation. 
I think the fact that I think that if undergraduates spent a half a semester, you know, undergraduates that are going to be exercise science, exercise phys, college, public, pro team, pro sport, if they spent a half a semester or were required to intern in a private sector job in the business side of fitness and performance, I believe that would round them out with a massive upside that I see them lacking a little bit, but I think that's, that's not something new. That's something that's been here. We have prioritized that at the Citadel. I've always prioritized getting them the, to understand like customer service, people management, um, cost savings, you know, be, be, you know, treat, we always played a game. We said, treat this as if it were a business, treat the athletes like they were paying customers, treat your sport coaches and your administrators as they were shareholders and you were bound to them by a bottom line. Okay. If, if the athletes weren't coming back in January, how's your business going to thrive and succeed? And we played that game. I mean, for at least probably the last 10 years, my staff will tell you that I've said that to them. We've talked about that. And, um, I think that dynamic of putting that framework over the public sector, the, the college sector, I think it, I think it helps the coach um, deliver a better product and experience to the athletes, which ultimately raises their productivity, turns them into a champion of yours, and gives you a better review on the exit interview. Yep. I'm so, so up for that. It's, yeah, great way to frame it. And there's been quite a lot of people who've come on the podcast who've come through a personal training background. They worked in a commercial gym, I don't know, like LA Fitness or whatever you guys, whatever chain, big chains you have over there, and have come through that and have have looked back and seen that as turning points in their career and how it's helped them go for 10, 15, 20 years after that. Same with teachers. Same coming from the teaching um, background, like many of the older uh, guests that I've had in the podcast, but particularly the personal training guests. Like if Mary, the 50 year old accountant who comes to me on a Tuesday and a Thursday, isn't enjoying the experience, I'm not getting that 50 pounds or $50 for the hour because she ain't coming back. She'll go somewhere else. So you've got to learn to be able to interact with that person, make that, make them feel special for that hour and make, and make that experience. So to then have you say that that is the model that you would use or overlay on your program. Great. I've never heard that before. Oh, it's and, great. And, and, and so Rob, to not, not totally change gears here, but this is worth talking about right now at this point in the conversation. So I, I just told you that that was my start, right? I got, I got exposed to that in that year before I came down here. And now I came back into the college game with a different perspective than most, right? Where am I at now? I'm 14 years later and now I'm back with that dynamic. You know what? So I, so during my onboarding uh, with play, I got, I got to, um, I got to spend, and it was supposed to be 45 minutes with our founder. His name is Brett Waits. And he's a fantastic guy. It was supposed to be 45 minutes. And I had, I had like meetings, you know, after him. We went about 90 minutes. We blew through the next two meetings and we had such an engaging conversation because what he did was he, he went over the brand story of play. And so it's the, it's the, it's the corporate PowerPoint. It's the, it's the, I was so excited to see this because I've always been a, a why guy, not a, not a what guy, you know, like if you can articulate to me the why behind we're doing something, I will not stop in the pursuit of that mission. If, I, if, if the why is clear to you and you're able to articulate it to me and it's something I can get on board with, I will not stop. I will, I will relentlessly pursue our goals. And if I don't know how to do something, I'll find a way to get that information that I will not stop. You, you, you will unlock my potential by communicating to me the why. And that was what I saw what happened with athletes. That's what I saw what happened with my staff. So I'm on this PowerPoint with Brett. We're having a discussion and he's going through this thing and it gets to a point where you know, he's talking about, we are not going to be encapsulated. Our value at play is not going to be encapsulated by any one product. Like, hmm, like well, what is it going to be? In and it's our product. This is the next slide that popped up. And our product is the customer experience and trust. And then, I mean, he unpacked that in a, in, a, in just in a, like there was, 
that wasn't just it. And we moved on. Like there was levels to that. And there was, there was definitive, here's how we go about nurturing relationships and, and, and creating moments for, for our customers and, and understanding and knowing the industry and delivering uh, on an exceptional timeline with a sense of urgency, with great precision and, and with teamwork fueling the whole thing. Everything that I just said to you that he said to me, I probably said those things uh, a thousand times over the last 14 years to my staff. So I'm sitting here listening to this brand story and what we're about as a company. And it's the things that I've lived for the last 14 years. And that's why, I, you know, I've had the conversation of like, um, you know, what made this move the right time and how'd you get to this, to this job and all that. And it's because like the last 14 years I've been prepared, I've been training for, for, for a job like this. Um, we didn't even get into that. Like, how did I, how did I get to the point where I knew I was ready to move? And maybe we will, maybe we won't today, but like, there's, I can't tell you, like I'm, I'm two months in and there's not a week that goes by where some puzzle is presented to me with, with the new company. And I can go back and draw a direct line to the Citadel to five years ago when I was helping with the gender equity review. And, and here's what I had to do for that. And now I've got to do some, some kind of research and reporting for the, the financials with play now. And I did that because I did it in the gender equity review that, that nobody else wanted to do. You know, how do you go and, and how do you go and, uh, and, and meet with um, an athletic director and his senior staff, his or her senior staff and present in your first month on the job? Because I had to do that to a Navy SEAL commander for 10 years. You think an AD intimidates me? I worked for a, a four-star general. <laughs> so so uh, it's just amazing that when you're open to delivering the customer experience, it leads you down these paths that make you acquire tactics and skills that serve not only that one customer, but they serve, I would argue, any customer from any industry. And I'm living, I'm that in the flesh right now. Now, whether or not I turn out to be good is the jury's out on that. I've got a, I've got a job to do here and it, the jury's out right now, but I'm just telling you, I feel really prepared because of the things that we're discussing here uh, in terms of the customer experience and delivering, um, just, just exceeding those expectations of the people in your charge. I think this is something that people forget. Strength coaches forget, whether they're assistants, whether they're heads of, directors of, whatever it is. How applicable their skills that they're developing every day are to other industries i mean you're not fl you're not you're not completely shutting down the the industry that you're in to, to flip to finance because that's an example we've used already you're still in sport you're still in elite sport collegiate sport etc but there's caveat there's, there's other avenues to elite sport to collegiate sport that are not directly with athletes and you're in you're in one of them i was in one of them with catapult and all that experience that you've got, you have much more than me of, of 14 years, is so applicable in these scenarios. It is so transferable. And I think it's something that, that people forget and think I'm I'm not trapped, that's probably the wrong word, but I'm I'm gone down this one narrow road and I've got a undergrad, I've got a master's, and that's me. Well, no, it's not, because all this is so transferable. And I think that should, or it would for me give me comfort to say I'm not down, I'm not on this narrow route. I'm on this big triangle, upside down triangle, and I'm at the bottom. And there's all this space and all this opportunity above me because I've done this work as a strength coach, head, director of, assistant, whatever it may be. So yeah, I think that should give, that story that you just give right there should give people a lot of comfort that they're not just on this narrow path. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise you, right? I'll take your comfort but I'm going to, I'll see your comfort, but I'm going to raise you yeah, confidence 100%. and courage. Yeah. Confidence and courage. So for your listeners now, I'm going to get into a thing that's very dear to me. And I want everybody to, to, you know, if there's a, if there's a piece of this that I would say, man, this would be worth listening to and to remembering, um, yeah, this, this section would definitely be it or one of them. Um, so I, I want to go back in time if, if, if I may. And I think we're, I mean, we're already at an hour here. It's fine. So I, I'll, I'll, Don't I'll worry. try to wrap this hmm. up here, but. I'm going to go back in time because I do want to acknowledge two people that may or may not know uh, the impact that they had on me 11 years ago. So 2011 was the first time I went to 
the CSCCA's national conference, and it was in it was in Kansas City. And you want to talk about a rock star moment experience? Like I, I mean, I, I my heroes are from this industry. Like the the people that got my head out of my ass, so to speak, when I was nineteen and twenty, were strength coaches. Okay, and this 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 whole thing of ours is really in a way got me into into high gear and got me on the right road. I was on many differing wrong roads. So I'm at a I'm at this event and it is blowing my mind. I'm seeing rock stars and hearing names that I've read about and heard about and all of this stuff. And and it was the first year that the CSCCA had the round table, which has since become, at least to my knowledge, it's been a longstanding event. It it, it continues on. It's one of the highlights of the uh, of the week of the week that you're out there. Pat Ivey and the University of Missouri staff were the ones facilitating this first round table. And I go into this thing and fascinating event. I mean, they broke us up into different tables. You were, you were like, you know, like I was going to sit with my, I think I was with one of my assistants at the time. And like, we were going to sit together with our friends. Well, the first thing they told us when you walk in was, Hey, just do your best to sit with a different staff. Let's get to know each other here. And so we did that. We, we broke it up and we, and we just had this amazing experience for 45 minutes. And then at the end, Here's, here's, what, here's what we leave uh, on the table with. It, you know, we, we have been in these working groups and they're talking about, you know, what, are, what do you have that, that we're going to face in this industry? And here are the three things that I can remember. This was a, this was a, this was a, was a career altering moment for me uh, in my professional life. My pen's ready. My pen's you ready to go now. <laughs> you have three things. To, oh yeah, write these down. You're going to be excited. Okay. Here's number one. You are going to be absent from your home and your family. Here's number two. You are going to have low credibility in the eyes of the decision makers on your campus and institution. No job security. Number three, you're not going to be able to retire because the most of us in this room are not going to make enough money uh, to, to, to put money away for retirement. Those are the three things after I just had the most eye-opening 45-minute experience that's what we put on the table as real problems that we face. So it was in that moment, we walked out of that room and I mean, subconsciously, but consciously also, I, I, I made a, like a vow with myself. Like I, I, I would have signed it in blood if I wouldn't have scared half the people out of the room. But I was like, I'm not going out like that. I am not going out like that. I don't, I'm not gonna throw in a towel. But when I get out of this thing or wherever this career takes me and however, wherever I land, I'm doing it on my terms and I am not just going to exist within the confines and circumstances of this industry. I'm going to help shape them and I'm going to influence them so that myself, I don't fall victim to what we just described in there. And also I potentially may help others avoid those things as well. So that was the first piece of this, right? There was that come to grips with reality moment. I'm not going out like that. They, they, I, I loved that all those people in that room who I respected so much were able to put those things out there and say, here's the problems. Because until you know it's a problem and until you're aware of the problem, you can't fix it. You can't, you can't go about fixing it. So that was the first day of the conference. The last day of the conference me and Candace was her name. She was with me. She was my assistant at the time. We're running to the airport. And we had like 50 minutes before we literally had to jump in a cab because we were going to miss our flight. But there was a presentation. It was one of the last of the week. And it was a presentation called Chess Not Checkers. And it was put on by the Baylor staff at the time. And the guy's name at Baylor at the time was Kaz Kazadi. And Kaz Kazadi, I think he's now at TCU. And Pat is at Louisville. Um, just incredible careers, right? So the point of this talk, chess not checkers, and it was almost like, now that I think about it in hindsight, it was like the Baylor staff teed up, like, let's all get to know each other, but then we're going to throw these problems out on the table for you to decide if you want to address them. And then the, I'm sorry, the Missouri staff did that with the round table. I think I just said Baylor. So the Missouri staff threw the problems on the table and made them real for us. 
Then the Baylor staff gave us their suggestions and their advice as to how to address those things. And, and look, there was a, I, I, I still have my notes somewhere. Like I took a million notes. They were talking about things that you didn't hear at that time. They were talking about all the stuff that we, that we just talked about. I mean, business management and, 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 and just treating it like a business and like customer experience. They were talking about all that. They were talking about that constant headbutting that you have with administration and strength coaches. And they were, they were unpacking this thing to the level that I had not seen up to that point. And I still would, would argue that that talk, you don't, you don't, I wish that talk was taped because that talk would be worth everybody seeing. And it definitely stood out to me, but Kaz at the, near the end of it, he, he said, you know, where is the profession going? And he said, it is going the MBA route, the MBA route, the master of business administration route. Now I obviously didn't get an MBA, but I listened to what he said. It made a lot of sense based on the case that they had made. Okay. And so from that conference, we go out and that was like, kind of set me into uh, overdrive on all this stuff. I started, I started studying business management. I, I probably for like two or three more years, you know, I read as many uh, performance-based books as I could, which there was a lot of good ones out there. Um, I was always an avid reader with performance-based books. Um, I think the last one that I truly dug into, like cover to cover, highlighted, made notes, was probably Triphasic Training by Cal, Cal Dietz. And, and that was like 2014. Um, so around 2014, 2013, my interest in reading shifted from performance to people. And I started studying business management. I started studying like coaching biographies. I started studying uh, tech startup stories, you know, the Google way. Um, um, the, the Zappos founder wrote a book that was a really good uh, Starbucks, you know, Howard Schultz. I, I started reading those kind of books. And I started seeing almost like the cover being pulled back or the curtain being pulled back as to like, to your point earlier, as a strength coach, we've already talked about how saturated the industry is. So that means you got to be competitive. You have to stand out. You have to be really good at the competencies that come with the job. You have to be the racehorse running the race with blinders on. Because if you're not, you, you, you just can't make it to the point where you're, where you're distinctive and competitive. What happens to the racehorse that's running the race like this? They don't see the periphery, okay? They don't see an opportunity because they're moving so fast and so dialed in that they lose sight of maybe the real issues that are out there that they need to deal with. And they also forget, like, for that racehorse, all that racehorse is ever going to be is that racehorse, right? Right? So for me, I wasn't going to sit here and be just Donnell, the strength coach. Like, I'm, I'm not going to be that. I'm going to be the strength coach that I'm going to open the aperture and I'm going to say, what is the cost benefit to me studying another exercise science textbook versus what is the cost benefit to me reading uh, the Heath brothers, you know, switch how to create change when groups want to resist change. The, the, the cost benefit is much greater reading the other book, reading the, the switch book. Because the problems that you see in the, in, the, in the issues and the speed bumps that you run into, they're not thing problems, they're people problems, okay? So I just got really aggressive in, in trying to build up a skill set and learning about business and learning about um, uh, you know, everything out there from leadership to um, staff dynamics and basically got a pseudo MBA with my own, with my own, my own personal library. And then, so I didn't go back to school and get an MBA because at the time we didn't, the MBA at the Citadel would have been, it was a, it was a really, really dense course offering. So we had a new degree. It was online, fully online. It was, I wanted to say I did the math. I could take one class per semester, fall, spring, summer, summer. And I could get it done in two and a half years. And it was a degree that was a master of arts in social science, but I could pick the focus and I chose the focus to be leadership. So when I got the course catalogs of the books that were, that were being used for the classes, <laughs> I had already read half of them. I had already read half of them. 
And, and I'll tell you right now, man, this is not a knock to like exercise science, but that degree, there wasn't a week that went by that I didn't go to work on Monday morning and have some new concept, idea, philosophy, strategy that I could deploy on Monday morning or talk about with my staff. And it just seemed to make everything. So it started back in 2011 with that mindset of applying the business perspective to what we do. It, 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 it even started before that with cats being in the private sector, but I had those two strength coaches and their staffs kick my butt into high gear. And then I spent 14 years of just going to work on that, acquired a second master's degree along the way, got a couple certifications, did uh, ethics training, diversity and inclusion training, um, really found out good ways to, to, to filter um, continuing education and, prof and professional development uh, sources that were out there. Because if you know how to if you know how to hit YouTube and TED Talks, you got it. That's a master's degree. That's a PhD education waiting on you if you know how to set it up and schedule it. And that was it, man. That got me all into it. And then I started thinking about, um, you know, career. Like I, I. So when that talk, when those talks happen, like I said, I'm not going out like that. Well, that didn't mean I was running away from the industry. That what that that was the last thing it meant to me. What it meant to me was. I've got my work cut out for me if I'm going to create a better tomorrow in this industry. And that's what I did. So if you looked at my career at the Citadel, my position evolved every four or five years. I went from being a head strength coach to being a assistant athletic director slash junior administrator to being uh, still like, you know, in between junior and senior administrator, but also being a liaison to the military arm on, on campus. And oh, by the way, um, I did have a part, an official partnership with the exercise science program. And we launched uh, multiple degrees, degree programs. We launched two on uh, uh, an undergrad online program, a graduate online program certificate, and then a residential uh, graduate program. So I was in that process and those meetings. So I didn't, run from the profession. I just changed the profession, what it meant for, for me. Um, and I did it all while staying at the same place, which I understand is not on the, on the table for everybody, but I did that while staying in the same place. And in the process of doing that, it made me appealing to a company that is fantastic. They are sophisticated. They are team oriented. They've got a decades plus of consistent growth, and I believe they're in this thing for the right reasons. And I'm able to now deliver products. What am I doing now? So my job title, I didn't even, we <laughs> probably should have came, came first, but my, my job title is director of business development for college and pro sports at play. And a lot of people say, well, was that sales job? Like, what is that? They, they don't know what that is. And to be honest with you, I didn't know what it was until I, I started talking to Rich Gray. And so my job now is part consulting, part sales and part marketing. And they're not always equal parts, but they are equally important parts, okay? Um, but what I do, I, you know, two months in, I've realized what I do. Here's what I do, man. I coach people through the, how can I phrase it? Milestone moments of upgrading their facilities to better serve their people at scale. What, what was I doing for the last 14 years? I was doing the same thing. I just was working with my kids and, and our team and staff. And now I'm doing it for a company and I'm over the country and I'm visiting the coolest, the, these heroes that I talked about. I was just at, uh, you know, text. Like, well, I yeah, I doubt, that. doubt. I suppose all the places that I've been, but like the people, the people that I'm with and I'm working with are my freaking heroes. They're awesome. They're awesome people. Incredible people. People doing awesome things at the height of the profession uh, around four quarters of the United States. And oh, by the way, I've got an incredible team that we work with. And because of the last 14 years and the things that I prioritized and the way that I stretched myself, uh, it made me appealing to this company and to their leadership to come in and assist where I can to help them move the ball forward. So um, I think that everybody has that on the table. Everybody can do that. So it's not about the mission being, well, you know, do your job so you can take a different job. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is do the job that you have until you reach a level of efficiency to where you can expand your, your duties and responsibilities. And that will enable you to get promotions. It will enable you to evolve your job. 
it will enable you to take some of the the more menial and uh, mundane things that you that you had to do previously to take those off your table and and you could evolve your job right where you're at so that hopefully 10 years in 15 years in 20 years in you're they don't even know how to write the job description for you because you've changed the job and you've become so indispensable to your your institution that they that you're gonna have to sit down and rewrite that entire job description because of the value you brought to the project. I think that is an incredible place to finish off. I know there's we could go literally we could go for another hour because there's a bunch of other things that we wanted to cover. However, that just leaves the door open for a part two, don't know, doesn't it? <laughs> but no, I think that, to, man. yeah, yeah, the overarching theme for me is I said comfort, you said confidence. I prefer yours over mine. Yeah. Yeah, no, both. I think both. Yeah. We need both. We need both. You absolutely need because because I can't tell you, Rob, how many people go to their job in a day to day of and discomfort's not a bad thing. Like, trust me. OK, our, I came from a place where we, we navigated discomfort. Discomfort to me is a positive thing. Right. But you don't want to come home and be discomfort. And I know a lot of people that work a job that is so stressful and so demanding. Uh, it is it is it is relentlessly uncomfortable. And we do want to reach greater levels of comfort and efficiency and and those type of things so don't get me wrong comfort i think is absolutely important i just want you to also from that i want you to build the so confidence to, just and to, to frame that that round table like you're not going to have any job security that may potentially be the case but given what you just said for the 25 minutes to half an hour after that little story should give people the confidence that they can transition there is other routes to do cool stuff to visit your idols and your your mentors in in other facilities and other institutions, but still stay in and do what you love. So that's a, I think that's a really good message. Donnell, if anyone wants to reach out or check you out on social media, you've mentioned social media already. Where can people do that? Because it's changed recently. You've got to change yeah. it since the new since the new job. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if my new uh, if my new call sign is good or not, but I had to change it. I had no choice. Uh, it used to be Citadel Coach D. This is on Twitter and uh, and Instagram, but now it's AKA Coach D. So if you if you type that handle in AKA Coach D on Instagram, Twitter, I'm very active on both. I love a good discussion. Uh, I I make it a point to do what we just did here for the last hour plus. I want to present my experiences, my thoughts, um, my my thinking. That, that maybe isn't even my experience, but it's something I'm thinking about in the future. And I want to put information and material out there that I would have loved as an 18, 19 year old strength coach, or even a, 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 a one of my peers. That's all I do on social media. You will get the occasional, uh, new, you know, New England sports stuff, and I'll be talking about movies and TV shows that I like. But the majority of stuff that I, that I post is just information and material that I honestly believe in my heart will help people uh, reach their goals in the to performance have. industry and refreshing that that's actually linked to social how that's perceived on social media and how that's portrayed on social media so but donnell thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you not only for the last hour and a quarter that we've recorded but the little bit of time we had beforehand as well so it's been a pleasure look forward to chatting again and uh, we'll catch up soon